but as Peter Marshall, who was at the game, reports, many of the Liverpool families believe there's been a cover-up over what happened next. At Liverpool, they're still singing justice for the 96. Nearly two decades after the disaster at Hillsborough, they're still waiting for answers. They still want to know how and why so many died at a football match. Officially, the police were blamed for their lack of any basic crowd control, incompetence and negligence which led to the disaster. But there are other questions which remain, questions which still trouble those whose lives have been scarred. If you're able to resolve the issues, completely finalised and everyone was happy, then you could let it go and remember the event and just move on, you know. Well, until you get a resolution to some of those things and stop the cover-up, really, isn't it? That's, that's what you feel? You feel you yeah, it has been covered I up. think it's always been covered up, yeah. There was a disaster at Hill, Hillsborough in the main disaster. Then and you another had one. another disaster yeah, exactly. which followed it. And that is a can of, as Margaret said, it's a can of worms that no one wishes to open. Just across from Liverpool's home ground, there's a shop for one of the campaigns for the truth of what happened when they went to a semi-final at Hillsborough in Sheffield in 1989. It's well established how badly led police presided over chaos. The failure to plan any sort of queue for 24,000 Liverpool fans led to a terrifying crush outside Hillsborough. I was in it and explained that night. Those of us who were trying to get in, into the Leppings Lane end of the ground, the Liverpool end, were quite perturbed and angered at the lack of adequate policing, uh, which led to dreadful crushes outside, which in turn led to the police opening the double gates because they said they couldn't cope with the awful crush. What happened was the police opened a gate, adding to a killing crush inside on the terraces. With people dying before their eyes, the police were then fatally slow to act. The Liverpool Memorial records the 96 who died. Down the years, the bereaved and survivors have struggled and failed to have anyone held accountable, not only over the failure of crowd control, but also over what happened after the crush. The timing is all important. The coroner ruled that all those who died had sustained their injuries by 3.15, and that timing's been crucial for the last 20 years because it's meant, whatever the intention, that effectively there's been no meaningful inquiry into the failings of the emergency response at Hillsborough. Now, many of the families believe their loved ones were still alive after 3.15, and perhaps some could even have been saved given proper medical assistance. But the 3.15 cut-off means there's been no accountability. But I've always been concerned about the 3.15 cut-off time. I think it's been a time of, of convenience. I don't believe it. I've never accepted it. Because? Because of what I saw. The Isle of Bute off the Scottish coast is a place to breathe, as far from the horrors of Hillsborough as you might wish for. Tony Edwards came here to escape the memories. He's the only South Yorkshire ambulance man to have got to the Liverpool end of the pitch on that bleak day. Now he recalls answering 999, arriving at the ground and facing hell. And a police officer came up to the side door, pulled the slide, sliding door open and said to me, you can't go on, they're still fighting. They're still fighting? Yeah, that's what he said, he said they're still fighting. This was obviously not a fight, from a good way down the pitch. So we looked to the chief ambulance officer, shouted to him and said uh, we couldn't go on. And he opened up the other side door and said, I don't give a who's saying you can't go on. And he slapped on our two-tone horns. Uh, and said, I, I want you to go onto the pitch and don't stop until you get to the far end. Over 40 ambulances went to Hillsborough and were left waiting or diverted to other parts of the ground. But at 3.36, 21 minutes after the coroner's cut-off time, we see Tony Edwards' ambulance alone drive inside down to the Liverpool end. And, and just as we were getting on, that's when I noticed the first body on um, uh, some billboards. And I thought, is he dead? So the scene was chaos. 
yes, the scene was absolute chaos. But in the main, people were doing their best. Most of these people had never seen a dead body before in their lives. And so when they were prioritizing themselves and putting casualties onto billboards... To carry them as stretchers, as makeshift stretchers. Uh, to make makeshift stretchers. They placed the bodies on the back, which is an indication that, you, you know, if you had somebody unconscious, somebody not breathing, and, and you can't assist them, you, you turn them on the front in order to be in what we know as the recovery position. So they were doing it the wrong way, that wasn't because they didn't know? In the panic, they were doing it the wrong way, and, and, and nobody knew. I think, had we got crews onto the pitch, had we organised ourselves in the proper way that you'd organise a major incident, then today the story may have been very different. In Liverpool, nearly a hundred bereaved families and many more survivors are braced for the 20th anniversary of Hillsborough, their disaster. Of course, they still grieve privately, but their anger is public and focused. James Aspinall was 18 when he went to Hillsborough. After 20 years, his mother says they've yet to be told the truth about how he died. If James had have died on his own, he'd have had his own private inquest. I would have found out then the time where, why, when, and especially who, who helped them. Now, I have had none of them answers at all, really. But, but the point is that, that the coroner would have said James would still have been lost, he'd still have died. How can he say that? You know, they weren't declared dead till four o'clock, so you must assume that maybe they had some life before that. Doreen Jones lost her son Richard and his girlfriend Tracy. You know, oh, even please. if only one person could have been saved, then, you know, lessons must be learnt about Hillsborough of how to go about these rescue operations and how triage should be done. But nothing like that happened. There was no triage, there was no prioritisation no, of, of, of who to save, Absolutely who to save. Absolutely And in nothing. fact, people were feeling for a pulse and finding none and throwing a coat over their head so everybody else walked past. Phil Scraton's an academic and author who spent years researching Hillsborough, the coroner's inquest and the legal implications. Certainly the pathologists who were giving evidence at the inquest believed that the 315 cutoff was appropriate. But I'm afraid expert opinion by other senior pathologists since have said that there were people who could well have had survivable injuries that, who had actually received those injuries in the pens prior to 315. A number of people recovered after 315. Two people were left in a persistent vegetative state. It's a continuum. It's not one or the other. So a medical intervention is, uh, at, at, the, at that time, in that intervening period, could well have saved lives. Kevin Williams was 15. His mother's been told he was still alive and even calling her name shortly before 4 o'clock. I know from when he moved, when he came out, when he was pulled out at 3.28, he was run across, a, across the pitch by um, two Liverpool, or three Liverpool fans. And um, when, he, when he was taken into the gym by a uh, special WPC that day. So what's the next legal move now then? We're going to go back to the Attorney General yet again and ask the Attorney General to ask the High Court to direct a further inquiry. We're also going to look at the possibility of asking the government to have a public inquiry, which may be realistically the only way of finding out what really happened. It's bad enough to lose a child, but not to know, you know, how they died. You know, you just can't, you can't move on. I'd do anything to get it all opened again. Mm -hmm. And I would fight to, look, to the day I die to get it open until somebody, somewhere, comes out and gives us the truth of what happened after 3.15. On the Isle of Bute, Tony Edwards, the former ambulance man, prepares for the 20th anniversary of the day he can't forget, the day he believes the truth was lost. I think part of the problem is if once you start with not holding your hands up and admitting the truth, it becomes, it develops its own life, doesn't it? And, um, and both sides develop their own life, people having to prove stuff and people not and denying stuff and then eventually holding their hands up. Instead of, you know, you have to do these things honestly and I don't think it was ever done really honestly and that's been a mistake really. A mistake which continues to pile pain upon grief 20 years on. Peter Marshall reporting tomorrow morning's front pages now. Uh, politicians and their expenses are all over them. Jackie Smith, the photograph uh, on the front page of the Daily, uh, the Daily Telegraph, I'm so sorry.